magic. Good morning. As you've heard, um, I'm an XRAF pilot. My last job was at Boscombe Down, which is the sister company. Thank you. Which is the equivalent of DRDO. And as president of the Royal Aeronautical Society, we really are the sister organization to the Aeronautical Society of India. So I really do feel as though I'm amongst friends here. The Royal Aeronautical Society was founded in 1866. Oh, here we go. Here we go there. Here we go in that one. Wonders of technology. The Royal Aeronautical Society was founded in 1866. We have our 150th anniversary in just three years' time. We are a royal society. Her Majesty the Queen is our patron. We are a global organization. We have members in over 100 countries. And internationally, our membership grades are recognized as being the gold standard of aerospace professionalism. All of which supports our claim to be the world's oldest and most prestigious aerospace organization. But perhaps more importantly, we are also a charity. And we take very seriously our charitable obligations of providing public benefit. We may be the world's oldest aeronautical organization, but we are certainly not backward looking. And I believe that the Aeronautical Society today is even more relevant than it was when it was founded in 1866. Today, the international, national, and local challenges may well be different wherever we are in aerospace. But the opportunities that come from working together to make a difference by discussing issues of concern and by sharing and disseminating best practice are what the society in England and your society in India really is all about. Our society includes a wide spectrum of global aerospace community in terms of sectors and in terms of the demography. We have members from the academics and the industrialists, commercial and defence operators, regulators and those who have a political interest in aerospace. They are all represented. And for the aerospace industry to meet the demands and challenges of the 21st century, today's aerospace professionals must embrace the ethos of lifelong learning and continuous professional development. However, today's pool of aerospace professionals will not be numerous enough to meet adequately the demands and challenges ahead. The aerospace community must, I repeat, must, encourage and educate the next generation of young people to enter our profession if our community is to meet the demands and technological challenges that lie ahead. Today I shall be speaking mainly about the aerospace manufacturing side, but the sentiments that I shall express apply equally well to the global airline industry and to the sophisticated engineering support that underpins its operations delivering safe and efficient transportation. That one will work. Thank you. The UK as a nation is incredibly proud of our aerospace heritage. But over the last 50 years, we really have led the way in embracing globalisation. It comes as a surprise to many, especially to many people in the UK, to learn that the UK aerospace industry is still the second largest in the world. But this is now based on international collaboration, and increasingly this is delivered through international companies. The UK has probably the most open policy anywhere in the world towards inward investment, and we are also the home of some of the world's most internationalised companies. Uh, Rolls-Royce and BA Systems are two obvious examples. And it is a very important business to be in. Although some of the world's defence markets are in the doldrums, and of course your region here, where your LTIPP, is a very definite exception to that set of doldrums, the civil sector is still buoyant. It's very buoyant. And this, in the next slide, 
will give an indication of just how lucrative this trade is and how lucrative it is going to be over the next decades. And again, you will see that Asia and the India and Asia Pacific growth is what is really leading the demand. Here you can see just how currently dominant Airbus and Boeing are in the civil market. But they are being challenged. China in particular is beginning to raise that challenge. And as ever, investment in new technology will be the key to remaining ahead of the new challenges. The alternative route with challenges, of course, is to invite them into your enterprise through collaboration and through risk-sharing partnerships. The current generation of aircraft are providing increased productivity through advances in materials, advances in conventional turbofan engines, advances in advanced electronics. And they also display the best of conventional aerodynamics. But all this is not without problems. And we have seen recently that both major manufacturers have had problems with the introduction of their newest models. But who here would doubt that those problems will not be sorted? But to meet the challenges of the next 30 years, we will need even more imaginative solutions to some very, very complex problems. Customers will want ever more productive aircraft. But perhaps the most challenging task will be to do this with environmentally sustainable equipment. Our industry has accepted challenges in the past and has risen to those challenges. Two very obvious examples, noise reduction and fuel efficiency. However, to meet the next target of a carbon neutral airliner, even more radical technologies will be required. Now, I can't say how that is going to be achieved. No one yet knows how we are going to achieve the carbon neutral airliner. But it will certainly need several innovations, innovations in structures, innovations in engines, and innovations in fuels, as well as imaginative transnational approaches to air traffic management and control. And again, this will demand really very heavy investment in R&D by industry and by government. I'll turn very, very briefly to the military sector. Fifth generation combat aircraft really is the height of conventional military aerospace. It's stealthy, it has super crews, it has networked multi-role capabilities. It's equipped with high precision weapons. But such complex pro programs are incredibly expensive and take enormously long time in terms of development. And few states have this fifth generation technology. Perhaps only the USA can really claim on its own to have fifth generation technology. The UK and Europe, we are probably at about 4.5. Russia, four plus a little bit. China has ambitions, obviously, but still has a way to go. But the other real growth sector is, of course, the unmanned aerial vehicle. UAS, UAV, drone, call it what you may. And here there are a very different set of challenges. At one level, there is very open access to this marketplace. There are over 80 states that have their own UAV program. That makes it a very crowded market and a very competitive market. But towards the top end of the capability, such as the Reaper or the UCAV concept uh, illustrated here, cost and complexity rival the F-35, the Lightning II. They're certainly ahead of the F-16 generation. And these challenges are less in the airframe itself, but rather more in the miniaturization of the equipment, especially the sensors. Sensors, for physical reasons that many of you will know, it's difficult to make the physical sensor smaller. But we'll also need the development of integrated power generation systems and for the autonomous control, ever more advanced software. And I think we'll also see ways in which these platforms are manufactured. Think perhaps high-end sport car rather than the mass-produced family runaround. Now, it's often been said 
that the aerospace industry reached a technological plateau with the development of the jet engine and fly-by-wire. And that may, in some senses, still be true. But what a high plateau that is. Aerospace is at the centre of several incredibly complex technologies. Its power and importance lies in the integration of these technologies. And, as I have already described, some of the next generation of aircraft will have to push very hard at the very frontiers of knowledge. And this is where we need some very clever men and some very clever women. And there is a real shortage of these people. This is partly due to the demographics of the industry in the US and Europe. This actual slide is based on American figures, but the situation is very, very similar in Europe. And instead of having an industrial demographic with the bump in the middle, that's about 35 or 40, in the aerospace industry, it's very much shifted right to a very much older demographic. And this is providing real skills shortages. So where will we be looking to fill the gap? But this is a slide that really tells its own story, doesn't it? Your engineers may well be sought after. You can see here the figures of the sort of numbers of engineers being produced. And your engineers are being sought after by America and by Europe. But it's their potential which is also underpinning your regional dynamic and your local aerospace industry development and production. So, are we in competition for the same resource? I think not. As I have already stated, the UK has built and continues to have a very successful aerospace industry through international collaboration. And I think that we need to take that international collaboration forward into our most precious of all resources, the human resource. In 2006, the Aeronautical Society of India and the Royal Aeronautical Society signed a Memorandum of Understanding. This had a number of aims, some of which have been achieved and some which, frankly, yet haven't been achieved. However, I do believe that it provides the basis going forward for our two organisations to work together in order to help the global aerospace industry obtain the global engineering talent that it needs globally. Yes, there is a bright future in aerospace wherever it may be located. And the Royal Aeronautical Society and the Aeronautical Society of India will be there to support our people wherever they are in the world and whatever their nationality. And so finally, may I wish everyone here today, speakers and attendees alike, a very successful Aero India 2013 International Cinema. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for helping us understand the Royal Aeronautical Society's participation uh, in this context.